Hi. The first half of part two of Descartes' discourse ends with his warning that two sorts of people should not attempt his new method. Men of hasty judgment would succeed in doubting their received opinions, but without the mental self-discipline to follow through on the method, they would remain lost all their lives. And people who know they lack the mental ability to reliably distinguish true from false should put this book down and trust in the truths they receive from wiser minds. Notice two things Descartes implies about the reader here, perhaps as flattery. The reader must have the self-discipline and the mental acuity needed to complete the reform process once begun. Anyone with doubts about his possession of either of these abilities would be better off as he is and should not follow Descartes' path. Assuming we think ourselves up to the challenge, we press forward into the second half of part two, starting at margin note 16. Descartes tells us he would himself have been in this second group, trusting in the wise instruction of his teachers, if he had not had so many teachers giving such contradictory advice. He cites two sources for his incredulity toward what he was taught. First, there is no opinion so crazy or incredible that it has not been defended by some philosopher or other. Rather than being a storehouse of reason, philosophy is full of wild and contradictory views. Second, in his travels across Europe after leaving school, Descartes saw the diverse and incompatible customs and beliefs of people in different cultures. Yet he also saw that these people were not irrational or insane, but used the same reason as everyone else. At the end of the paragraph, he draws two conclusions from these experiences. First, we are clearly persuaded more by custom and example than by any certain knowledge in matters of how to live. And second, the popularity of an opinion is no proof of its truth. In fact, it seems more likely that a single person would have found the truth rather than a whole nation of people. Note that this is a very Platonic Socratic point. The mob is foolish and only the few are wise. Thus reasons Descartes, he could not find reasons to accept any one received opinion over any other and he was left to figure out the truth on his own. How should he proceed? His guiding principle will be caution, he tells us. He resolves to advance very slowly, so that even if he covers little ground, at least he avoids error and his gains are secure. He compares himself to a man walking alone in shadow, and if you have ever navigated your home at night, you know the carefulness Descartes describes here. There's no rush, just be careful not to put a foot wrong. He needs a plan for systematically evaluating all his knowledge, so this is what he turns to next. In his education, three fields stand out as possibly helpful in this project, logic, geometrical analysis, and algebra. Each of these has its strengths and flaws. What Descartes wants is a method combining the virtues of all three without any of their defects. Let's look at those virtues and defects now. Logic certainly gives us a method of obtaining certainty, reasoning forward from given premises. But it can only draw out the implications of what we already know, and it can be misused by rhetoricians. Furthermore, if any of the starting premises is false, the conclusion is not certain. And, Descartes tells us sadly, false premises are common among philosophers. Analysis and algebra are clear and give certain results, but they deal with abstractions that are not useful for daily life. Analysis focuses on numbers rather than on actions and things, and algebra is imprisoned in its many rules and symbols. So Descartes' new method will attempt to combine the strengths of these three fields while avoiding their limitations. To keep matters simple, he has just four rules, which he resolves never to break, not even once. Rule one, do not accept as true anything I do not clearly know to be true. In other words, 
accept only what is clearly and distinctly present to my mind in each judgment I make. Rule two, divide up each problem into as many pieces as needed in order to solve it easily. In other words, analyze and subdivide difficult problems into simpler ones until each unit is small enough to grasp clearly and distinctly. Rule three, keep my thoughts orderly by beginning with what is simplest and easiest to know, and then building up gradually to what is complex and difficult. And, this is important, work by assuming there is an order to things, even when I cannot perceive any order in them. Rule four, be complete in my calculations and thorough in my reviews, so I am sure I leave nothing out. In other words, maintain self-discipline throughout the whole process of knowledge discovery and checking. Before I go on, let me make a few comments about these rules. Rule one sets a very high standard for accepting anything as true. It suggests that I will find a large number of my current beliefs fail this test, and I cannot yet accept them as true. Rules two and three give me a way of building back my beliefs, though. Rule two tells me to analyze, to break up into smaller parts. Is my belief B clearly true? No. Then break it up into smaller parts. Are each of the parts clearly true? No. Then break them into smaller parts, too. Repeat this until I arrive at a belief that is so simple, clear, and distinct that its truth is clearly impressed upon my mind. Then, by rule three, build up from these small, clear, true beliefs back to more complex beliefs about myself and the world, always following the right order. Rule four reminds me to maintain the mental self-discipline and follow through necessary to complete this process and not become lost forever in doubt. Descartes then compares his task to the long chains of reasoning used in geometry and logic to prove a difficult truth by many small steps. His hope is that all possible human knowledge will eventually follow from this simple but careful process of building up from clear truths. Descartes tells us he began by applying his new four-rule method to mathematics and that he achieved the solution of several difficult problems in just a few months. But what he found even more pleasing than the solutions was the realization that by his method he was now using his mind as well as it could be used in finding truth. He had found the method best suited to using a human mind to discover truth. As his mind became more accustomed to reasoning in this way, he began to hope that he could use the method to find truths in areas of study outside mathematics. And here at the end of part two, he sets his sights on philosophy, which provides the principles of the other sciences. Since he was, in the story he's telling us in the discourse, only 23 years old at the time, he resolved to do two things, to strengthen his mind by practicing the method and to travel and gather experiences that will be useful to him later on. That brings us to the end of part two of the Discourse on Method. I hope you found this walkthrough helpful. Thanks for watching today. Goodbye.